lifelong learner is a, a phrase that I was first exposed to when my children were in elementary school and we would go to open houses at the school and we would hear these educators saying over and over again, they're going to make our children into lifelong learners. Uh, I'm kind of a curmudgeon of a guy and I, I heard this and I just thought of it as just a, a phrase that they would just use to, to make it sound more important. I'm the kind of guy who uh, I want my kids to learn how to read and write and get through their material and do well and succeed. Um, I didn't really think about lifelong learner. So my kids went to Burn Knox West, though. They did very good. I'm very happy with them. They're in college now. They got an excellent education. It's a great school. But they didn't come out as lifelong learners. They came out very well educated, and they came out with the ability to process information in a way that they could complete their assignments, um, but not a thirst for learning. To the credit of the school, the schools are trying to teach lots of kids lots of things, and my kids were taking AP classes and varsity sports and the musical and working on their eagles. They didn't have a lot of time. The homework is crushing in high school with AP coursework. So they didn't have the luxury of a, a luxurious education. They had to get their assignments done, do them right, do them correct, do the best they can on them. So it really didn't foster a lifelong learner. I wasn't a lifelong learner in school. Um, I was pretty far from it. One plus I had going for myself is that my mom is an educator and she taught me how to read. I could read uh, before I went to, went to kindergarten. In 1972, it was a whole lot more rare than that it is now. And they really didn't know what to do with you if you could read. You were there in school to learn how to read in kindergarten and first grade. So I was lucky enough to get put with a bunch of other kids that were much more gifted, much smarter, and much harder working than I was but we were all avid, advanced readers. But again, the school didn't really know what to do with you, especially in elementary school. They didn't know what to do with you, and so they give us special projects and things to work on. But most of us, by the time we were in the upper grades of elementary school, we were reading middle school material. And by the time we hit middle school, we were hitting high school material. So in some ways, it was a plus to be an advanced reader. I have a distinct memory. Um, of going to my grandfather's house. My grandfather was a, a huge person in my life. My mom, it was my mom's dad, and she took me there to, when I was four to read to my grandfather. She woke him up. He was a second shift worker, and he was taking his nap. And she woke him up, and she said, Dad, I'm going to have John read to you. And I, I read to him, Dick and Jane. And I just remember him crying because he was literate. He could do a little bit of math, and he could read a little bit, but it was very painful. And he was just overjoyed by the fact that his grandson could read. And even then, and, and through my young life, I realized how important that was to my grandfather and how important it was to be able to read at an early age and be proficient. So when you get to middle school and high school and you're an advanced reader, especially in high school literature and English, it's painful. They hand you a book. And that's what you're going to do for a, a, a quarter. And I would take the book home and I'd read it. And I'd read it in the first weekend and I'd be done with it. And they would spend the next 10 weeks going sentence by sentence, page by page, chapter by chapter through this book. I had already read it. I understood that they have to teach to everybody in the class. So, But I'd be off reading other things. I'd read other books in class. I was that compulsive all the time. One of the things that was particularly hard on me was reading things like 1984 and Animal Farm. They would plod through these books and they would dissect all the symbolism and all the meaning in these books. And even at a young age, a lot of times I just looked at it like, is, is this really what the author meant? Or is this what an educator or an ap academic says that this means? It really didn't do a lot for me. It really didn't spark anything with me. I, I enjoyed them, but it really didn't, it didn't spur anything. On a strange aside, my children, my two youngest children in particular, who are not avid readers, love those very same books. They will, they will quote sections of those books, and they'll talk about it all the time. It's dinner time conversation often. So it's every kid is different, every person is different, and what they get from those classes. I very rarely meet an adult who said, I became an avid reader because of high school literature. What I often meet is people who go, I didn't like reading to begin with, and after I got done with literature, I really didn't like reading. Again, 
it's not a ding on education. They have to teach what they have to teach and the curriculum. But I very rarely meet people who become avid readers. An exception is in my own family. My sister struggled with reading all through our youth. I would be reading the back of the cereal box and she would be struggling through her reading. As an adult, she's an elementary school teacher, she became an avid reader and she reads even more than I do now. So there, that proves me wrong in some ways that some people, as they become older adults, they, they become readers. So I got out of college, I went to college, I made a mess pretty much out of college the way I did out of high school, same reasons, lack of maturity, uh, lack of effort, and lack of applying myself. But I got out of college with a degree and I had to build a life. So I became a license, I became a land surveyor, never got my license, but became a, a land surveyor. And I just worked. I had to put a roof over my head. I had to buy a car, I had to pay for insurance, I had to buy food. So I just worked. I didn't have a lot of time for other things, I just worked. I met my wife, she's a surveyor also, she's actually licensed. I've been her chief of staff for 20 years. Um, and we just worked. And I traveled out of town a lot because I would make extra money to help pay for rent and food if I traveled out of town. The way I amused myself is I would read paperbacks, one after another, and I would just consume them. I luckily discovered used bookstores because I was putting us in the poorhouse buying paperbacks. So that's what I did. That's, that's how I amused myself. I didn't have any time or money to do anything else. We bought the farm out on Switzkill Road. My wife grew up in that farmhouse, and then my life became work, commute, work on the house, go to sleep, work, commute, and repeat, and then had children. And so it's tough to, to have time to do things. When I was a young man, a, a kid, I wanted to do model railroading, and I, I didn't know anything about model railroading. I didn't really have sources to go to. Nowadays, the internet, your kid has an interest in something, you go on the internet and you can figure it out. So when I got out on my own, I said, I, I want to look into this. So I started going to uh, model train stores and I, I discovered that I could buy, even though I had no money to speak of, I could buy used model railroad magazines for a quarter a piece and spend a buck or two and come home with a stack of magazines. And I just started consuming them. I just would read them cover to cover and try to learn everything I could about this new hobby. And I read about all these, all these different model, model railroaders and the things they were doing. And one of the things that was kind of new when I got started 30 years ago is uh, prototype modeling. Prototype modeling is re recreating a, a time, place, and era in model form. And 30 years ago it was kind of new, and now it's much more common. The real instigators of this was the RPI club at the college. They are recreating Troy in miniature. So I found that really interesting. I joined the Model Railroad Club at the Colvisco Fairgrounds and learned about the Schoharie Valley Railroad. I'd always had an interest in American history. Um, in 1976, I was a fourth grader. We learned American history during the bicentennial. It was an amazing year. We had a teacher, Mrs. Legere. She loved American history. She loved us. We loved her. It was just an amazing year. It was probably one of the best year in the, out of the 13 years of public school that I, I did. So I was interested in the Schoharie Valley. I learned about these two railroads that ran in the, in the valley and their role in the valley. And so with the help of other club members, I built a layout at the fairgrounds and reproduced Schoharie, Depot Lane, most of the buildings in miniature. First year we were open for the fair, people were amazed. They recognized almost instantly most of the buildings. And to me, it really lit a fire with me. It, here was a chance to take my love of history and this new hobby that I was becoming obsessive about and mix them together. So around that time, I met a guy who became my mentor. His name is Tony. He's a civil engineer, and he was working for a firm that I worked at. Tony was a member of the RPI group, and he um, was a, one of the proponents of prototype model railroading. He had extensive files. He opened them up to me. He let me copy whatever I wanted to. He taught me how to how to do research, where to go. The internet was starting to really come into its own and into our homes. I met people through message boards and forum boards and by email and learned as much as I could about railroading and model railroading. I became interested in the railroad that runs from Albany to Delanson. Tony was interested in another section of the very same railroad, ran in a different area, had basis of information for me to use to start mine. 
and he taught me how to build my files. In that case, it was all paper files and where to get different maps and who to contact to get maps and documents. I also started learning to, to track down local history books written by historians and I read them cover to cover and I collected photographs from eBay and just compiled all this information. At the same time, um, I, I wanted to build a model railroad and our home is small and the only space I had was an uh, unfinished woodshed with a dirt floor and no insulation. So when I would get a little overtime, I would buy a couple sheets of sheetrock or I would buy some fiberglass insulation or wiring and I would work on the room. And it's been about nine years pulling together my research and filled a couple binders full of information. But I started to really realize I wasn't gonna be able to do what I wanted to do at the level I wanted to do it. I, I, I wasn't gonna be able to satisfy my interest in recreating this geographical area in the space I had. So I needed to find a new subject. So I found the Racket Lake Railway, uh, which ran in the 20s and the 30s, and it fit the bill for the space. And because I had experience from the first time around, I knew where to go. I knew to go to local historians. I knew where to get maps. I knew how to, how to compile files. And now with the internet in full bloom and things like Facebook groups, I was able to reach out to these local historians who now all have Facebook groups where they have photographs and I could get information much quicker. So I shelved the idea of the first project until I had a chance to retire and build a bigger basement with a drier basement in my retirement and I would start this new project. So I dove in and I got to learn about all sorts of new things about sawmills in the 20s and tourism in the 20s and railroading in the 20s instead of the 40s and 50s, which I had been doing. And I got to learn about all sorts of stuff about the Southern Adirondacks, which is one of my favorite areas to begin with. I spent a lot of time there as a youth. So I dove right into this project. Being a compulsive reader and a compulsive researcher though, I was making my wife crazy, I'm sure, by blathering on and on and on about all the stuff I was trying to find or I found. And she said to me, you know, you're a lifelong learner. Because she knew that phrase just always kind of sat funny with me. And she was right, like she is about lots of things. And I am a lifelong learner. But being a lifelong learner can cause paralysis. You're, you're trying to track down that one last bit of information, that one last photo, that one last article, that one last whatever. So you quote unquote, complete your project. But if you have another goal, my goal was to build a, a new layout. I wasn't going anywhere. I mean, the time was clicking by and this was the layout that was gonna be what I would do until I retired and, and the time was just going on and on and on. So it was time to get myself in gear. So five years ago, we dove in, we finished off the room, sheet rocked, insulated. It's like a part of the house. It's a comfortable spot to be. And I started the layout about four and a half years ago, and I'm, I'm delighted. It's not exactly what I wanted. I, I can't do exactly everything I wanted to. I don't think I could have ever done exactly what I wanted to do, but it is enough to satisfy my, my interest in, in doing this. And I got to learn so many new things, construction techniques, electronics, all sorts of things that I kind of knew a little bit, I had to learn more about, so it's been, it's been really great. One of the things about being a lifelong learner that I've found is that mentorship is a great way to share the knowledge that you've gained. You can spend your life gathering information, but if you don't share it with anybody, it's gone when you're gone. I have a friend of mine who was an encyclopedia of Capital District Railroading and World War II history. Great guy. Was always gonna build a layout, was always gonna do something in the future, in the future. He died young. When he died, it was like somebody flipped the light switch off and all that knowledge was gone. All that knowledge that he had spent 50 years accumulating was gone in a split second. I don't wanna be that guy. So I like teaching people. I'll tell people, anybody who will listen about my own project, but what I really like to do is help people with their own projects. I meet people all the time who wanna do what I'm doing, different location, whatever, wanna design a layout. I help them. I teach them how to research, how to, how to winnow down what you're finding, how to put it all together. So mentoring is, is a, a huge thing for me now that comes with having learned all this information. When I was asked to do this talk, I had to think about 
how did I become a lifelong learner? Like I said, I didn't come out of uh, high school or college as a lifelong learner. And it slowly dawned on me, it was from my dad. My dad learned to be a hunter from his father. My grandfather was not a very good hunter. Um, he liked saying he was a hunter, but he wasn't great. My father, on the other hand, loved being in the woods, loved to hunt, and loved to learn. And he, as I said, was an avid reader also. He would read novels, and then I'd pick them up and read them right behind him. And I was always reading beyond my, my grade level. And I remember one time, I, I loved, the one thing I love about reading is the vocabulary. And, and there was a word I didn't know what it meant, so I spelled it for my father. The word was brazier. And my father was like, what are you reading that you know this word? And he had to go read the book. And it was, a, it was really kind of a young adult book about somebody took my dinosaur. It was a Disney book. But I'd read anything that was laying around, even screenplays. So my dad learned about the, the woods and about hunting by just reading and learning and researching and being out in the woods and, and, and figuring it out. And he passed that to me. He, uh, he passed that on to me without, I think, either of us ever realizing that. I, I look at my kids and I see now, as they're young adults, my oldest is 22. He has an interest in American history and the Civil War. And he doesn't have the time, he doesn't have the money, to devote any time to it or any expenses to it because he's a college student. But I see it in him and I, and I think it might grow and I think my other ones will too. Hopefully I've been the influence to them that their grandfather was to me. We traveled a lot when they were young. We still travel a lot. We go to things like sawmills to learn how they work and I think that it will rub off on them eventually. I don't think it's something that you do get from education. I think you get it from other people and being exposed to it. So that's my journey as a lifelong learner. It's a continuous journey, it doesn't end. My father's in his late 70s, still is constantly learning. I'm still constantly learning. I'm pulling my smartphone out and looking up things. When I find things, if I, if I come across a building or whatever, I have thousands and thousands of photographic images of buildings in the Capitol District and railroad buildings and all sorts of stuff. I'm always looking to try to learn more. So that's my journey. My journey isn't really ever ending. My journey just keeps continuing.